So you may have recalled that in a previous video about phylum chordata that there were some weird organisms part of it. You definitely recognize some, I mean humans are in phylum chordata, and things like rabbits and toads and fish are found there too, but there were some weird ones. There were ascidians, our sea squirts, our lancelets, and a lot of ones that you're like, those just don't seem familiar. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into our phylum chordata and take a look at subphylum vertebrata. There are other subphyla as well. And this subphylum is probably the one that you're most familiar with. When we think of animals, most of the time, you're probably thinking of an organism in subphylum vertebrata. Now, while we have learned in other videos that this is actually a pretty small group, remember our arthropods and our mollusks are the largest. I mean, this is, I don't know, this is people's pets. <laughs> um, this is what people go on tours to go see. We have different examples here, like rhinos, birds, sharks, tortoises, frogs, and look, humans. You see how I did that? Uh, uh, so a lot of really staple organisms are found in this subphylum. So let's take a closer look and learn about what actually ties us together. So organisms in subphylum vertebrata share two commonalities. One, they contain a cranium. So in this picture on the left, this looks like a Pokemon, but it's not. Um, this is a, a fossil. Uh, the cranium is a piece of bone that covers the... Uh, uh, the brain. And I say bone, it doesn't necessarily have to be bone, it could be cartilage, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we have some sort of covering that covers the brain. And that's actually, um, I guess, one of two combining characteristics. The other characteristic is kind of where the name vertebrata comes from, is that organisms in the subphylum have a vertebral column of vertebrae. Now, when we think of vertebrae, we think of bones, we think of our backbone. In a lot of organisms, that's true. Soon, we're going to learn about, um, in a couple of slides, we're going to learn a little bit more about cartilage, um, which isn't bone. So that's why I kind of hesitate to say like, oh yeah, they're all made of bone. Most organisms it is, um, but really, vertebrae are just small building blocks so here on the right-hand side, this is looking at various types of vertebrae seen in the human um, backbone. But it's individual building blocks that come together. From an earlier video, we learned that the discs that are found between the vertebrae, they kind of help with movement. Those are remnants of our notochord. The hole that you're seeing in these vertebrae is where the spinal cord or that dors dorsal hollow nerve cord would be found. So it's something we see in phylum chordata as a whole, but within subphylum vertebrata, we're actually seeing these building blocks that have greater structure, which also allow for larger organisms. So again, both are all uh, organisms in subphylum vertebrata share this covering over the brain or the cranium, as well as building blocks called vertebrae to create that vertebral column or more commonly known as the backbone. But it's not always bone, which I try to avoid using the word backbone. So this is a complete list of all of the classes found under subphylum vertebrata. So remember we have phylum and then subphylum, Technically, there's super class, but not every group has super classes, and then regular class. Now, this list isn't necessarily evolutionary history. Um, a lot of these groups kind of evolved at similar times, so it's not necessarily, oh, lampreys evolved from common ancestors of hagfishes and cartilaginous fishes from common ancestors of lampreys. Those kind of relationships do exist in here, um, but it's not exclusive. For example, birds are actually listed today with reptiles. Um, they're considered the same or kind of the same phylogenetically, and then within reptiles branched off a little bit. So just know that it's not like a perfect this from this, this from this, uh, but it's close. So I'll run through these names so you've heard someone say them. Granted, 
I could totally be saying them wrong. It's all about confidence. So the more confident you are in saying it, the more accurate it is. Um, a lot of these are Latin words, which I've never taken before. So I could totally be saying these wrong. Um, so we'll start at the beginning. So the Mycenae are the hag fishes. The Petromizontida are our lampreys. Chondrichthys is our cartilaginous fishes. Um, and as the name implies, that they're made of cartilage. These are things like sharks. Actinoterygy is our ray finned fishes. This is the majority of fishes that you see. However, there is another group of fishes, the sarcoterygy, that are lobe finned. So their fins, particularly their front ones, um, have more flesh to them versus our ray finned ones. And then the next four are probably really familiar with you. So we have amphibia, which is our amphibians, reptilia, which is our reptiles. Aves, which is our birds, and then mammalia, which is our mammals. Now, for those of you actually taking my class, uh, we're going to do some activities in class where we explore um, these different classes more in the future. Now, within all of these vertebrates, there's, oh goodness, there's all sorts of commonalities that we have. I'm going to focus on three different characteristics that we can use to describe those invertebrata. These are not exclusive to this class, uh, or sorry, to this subphylum, uh, and I'll kind of mention that as we talk through these. So let's first talk about the heart. Now the heart is not unique to chordates. Hearts are found in other animals as well, like outside of the chordates. So you know, some arthropods have have hearts, annelids, like most, uh, I shouldn't say most, many animals have hearts and how those hearts look really just depend on the organism. Now, within vertebrata, when you think of the heart, it becomes a lot more similar. So for example, in subphylum vertebrata, we have what's called a closed system. So we have a heart and we have blood vessels and blood pumps through blood vessels. In other animals, some of them have an open system where they do have a heart that does pump, um, but it's pumping fluid throughout the entire body. Um, there's no arteries, there's no veins, it's just a pump that just kind of keeps things moving, um, but without actually um, moving it through a certain channel or canal or blood vessel. So all of our organisms in subphylum vertebrata do have a closed system, and we have a heart that has atria and ventricles. Maybe you're familiar with those terms, thinking about the human heart. Now our human heart, I'll actually kind of go backwards from here. So the human heart is what's diagrammed on the right hand side of this. And don't worry about all the other like words on here. They don't really matter for this. So the human heart, you may have learned before, has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. And we have a double loop system. One part of our heart or essentially one half, one half of our heart is going to pump blood to the lungs and it's going to do that to oxygenate it, to essentially recharge the blood with oxygen. And then it comes back to the heart. So not that you need to know these specifics, but just to show you. So here we have the side of the heart that's going to pump blood to the lungs. It gets oxygenated in the lungs and it comes back to the heart. And then once it's back in the heart, it pumps again, and then it's going to push that oxygenated blood throughout the body before returning back to the heart. So this is what I mean by like a, a double loop or a two loop um, system. One loop goes to the lungs, one loop goes to the rest of the body. But this four chambered heart is not seen in every animal. Actually, it's seen in very few animals. It's really just our mammals and our birds and the exception of crocodiles. You guys will learn more about that later. So let's move backwards from there. Before a four-chambered heart, there was a three-chambered heart. Uh, we see this uh, particularly in our amphibians and reptiles. And it's kind of similar to the human heart in the sense that there is two systems. There's one system that's going to pump blood to the lung, uh, sorry, to the lungs and to the skin, thinking about amphibians, to get oxygen. It comes back to the heart and then it pumps to the rest of the body to supply oxygen to the rest of the body. But the reason, I don't know if reason is the right word, but sure. The reason why it's a three-chambered heart is you'll notice there's two atria, 
So very similar to humans, but it's only one ventricle. There's no septum or divider in this ventricle. This comes at a downside because what you can see, and you can kind of see it in this picture too, is that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood are mixing in the heart. While that actual mixing itself isn't a big deal, it means the system is less efficient. The blood that's being pumped, the oxygenated blood that's being pumped to the rest of the body, isn't fully oxygenated because some of the deoxygenated blood was mixed with it. So it's not crazy efficient. Um, I mean, it's obviously better than nothing, um, but just keep that in mind. Like, it's not a superior system. We kind of think of the, the four-chambered heart as a superior system. And then finally, um, we have a two-heart chamber, which is what you see here on the left-hand side. And pretty much most of our fishes have this kind of system. So there's only one atria and one ventricle, and it pumps blood over to the gills. The gills is where there's going to be oxygen um, exchange or really gas exchange. Other gases get exchanged as well. And then we have this oxygenated blood that does not return to the heart. We haven't, that's what we saw in the other two. This one, the blood gets oxygenated in the gills and goes straight to the body. It doesn't come back to the heart. Um, it's just continuing. That single pump has like pushed it and it continues to pump and kind of push blood throughout the system. Um, so not, there's no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, which is great. Um, but what happens is the blood is definitely moving slower um, because it's not returning to the heart. It has to push through all the capillaries and the gills and then all the capillaries of the body, and it's going to slow down. That blood pressure is going to drop. So although it's usually regarded that the four-chambered system is the most efficient, keep in mind, we still have fish. We still have amphibians. I don't want you to think like, oh, the three-chambered heart is so inferior. Amphibians still exist, so obviously it's working for them. So try to keep that in mind. Like, although some have better efficiencies, doesn't necessarily mean that we're out-competing the others. So this is one characteristic, and again, as a last-minute reminder, many other animals have hearts. This is really focusing on just vertebrate hearts that have different number of chambers within a closed system. The next thing, again, not exclusive to subphylum vertebrata, is how we can describe the way organisms regulate their internal temperature. So one, or I guess both terms are endotherm and ectotherm. And if you actually just break down the words, it kind of tells you what each one is. So for example, endo means inside or within, and then therm is referring to temperature. So an endotherm are organisms that can regulate their internal body temperature. They can do it. Um, it comes from internally. I'll talk more about this in a moment. Whereas ectotherms, ecto means outside, therm, again, referring to temperature. So these organisms, their body temperature relies on what's going on in the environment as well as the behaviors of that organism. So let's just start with ectotherms because that's how I have it listed here. So here I have a turtle. This is a great example of an ectotherm as are other reptiles. And his internal body temperature is reliant on the outside temperature. Now this kind of looks like a desert. I have no idea. I just found this picture. Um, let's say this is a desert. It's probably really hot in the desert. And just like all other organisms, you can't be but so hot. If you get too hot, you're going to talk about really bad things happening internally. So what they might do is one, yes, their body's going to get warm, but a behavior they can do to cool down is digging a burrow, going into the shade. So while internally they can't alter their body temperature, they are able to take advantage of the environment in different ways in order to help them regulate. So for example, um, on a cooler day, a snake might be laying in the sun on a rock. The rock holds that heat a lot better than air or grass or soil. And so that's a way the snake is using to warm up. So really relying on the, the external temperature. Now, 
words you have heard before and you grew up with were cold-blooded and warm-blooded and oh my goodness erase those words from your vocabulary and you're like well you brought them up so an ectotherm is not necessarily cold-blooded this turtle chilling in a desert pretty hot pretty warm blood <laughs> things are things are warm in this guy's body so cold-blooded is not an accurate statement um so really try to avoid using those words yes i'll know what you mean yes other people will know what you mean um but it's not just like backbone like it's not always made out of bone cold blood cold-blooded it's not always cold blood okay sorry for that little rant um, then we have endotherms. Endotherms are, I guess, rarer. Uh, it's only mammals and birds that are endotherms. And endotherms um, have a lot of kind of things going on molecularly and physiologically that helps our body maintain, for humans, a 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, maintain a constant body temperature. We have internal mechanisms like uh, vasoconstriction and dilation, where our blood vessels literally move closer or further from the surface. And we have other things that we have as well. So fur, feathers, fat. Um, we have um, things like goosebumps. We have all sorts of different mechanisms, both internally and I guess kind of externally, if you think about fur and whatnot, that help us maintain a constant temperature internally. Now, this doesn't mean our temperature can't change sickness, or if you are in a very cold place, it might drop, um, but we're not really reliant on the environment. Like our body is doing that work to keep us consistent. So again, yes, technically warm blooded, but there are cold blooded animals also with warm blood. So stick with ectotherm and endotherm. The last characteristic I wanna talk about is cartilage and bone. Now, you're probably fa really familiar with bone because like you have bone, um, but you also have cartilage. Um, so you've probably heard of both of these terms before. So when we think about a skeleton, we usually think about bone. And that's not a horrible thing to think, like that's fairly accurate. But cartilage has a very important role as well. Your bone before it was bone was cartilage. Um, cartilage then ossifies or essentially becomes harder and turns into our bones. Cartilage that exists, so like your ear, right, never ossified. You'll know that it's lighter, so it's definitely lighter than bone. It's definitely more flexible. I can kind of move my ear or move my nose every which way. So the reason I bring up cartilage versus bone is because there are some organisms in subphylum vertebrata that have a backbone, they have a vertebral column, but it's not made of bone, it's made of cartilage. So this picture on the right hand side is a skeleton of a shark. Sharks, if you guys recall, are part of the cartilaginous fishes. So they don't have a bone skeleton. They do have some ossified structures of their body, but for the most part, their entire body is cartilage. It's really hard to preserve it. Um, so it's actually really cool to have a picture like this. But everything you see here is actually cartilage. So it's still providing structure to this organism. It's just not necessarily bone. So when we refer to, you know, cartilage-based organisms or bone-based organisms, we're really thinking about what is the majority of the skeleton made of? Is it cartilage like our sharks? Or is it bone like humans or fish or lizards? Now, keeping in mind that organisms that do have a bone skeleton usually have cartilage in them somewhere. Humans, we've got cartilage all over the place, not just facial features like ears and noses, but between our joints, there's a lot of cartilage. This is what makes it so that the bone hitting the bone like doesn't hurt as much. So just know that there's another classification, just what is the skeleton made out of? Is it majority cartilage or is it a majority bone? So that's all I got for subphylum vertebrata. Remember, a lot of those characteristics we talked about are not exclusive to just our vertebrates, um, but it is a way to differentiate between those nine different classes of vertebrates that we see. As I mentioned before, we're going to explore these more in class, maybe in the future that you'll see some videos on these as well, um, but you definitely already know a lot because this is where we're found. Enjoy!